This is Jonah Hill, and you're listening to the only podcast that matters. Throw gang, we are joined by the king of quips, the prince of the pen, his majesty of the memoir, the witticism wizard, his honor of the real housewives, the baron of Bravo, the imam of Trump insults, the Houston head honcho, the emperor of essays, writer, author, and Beyonce's future ghostwriter, Michael Arsenault. I was not anticipating such a lovely introduction in a dystopic nightmare, so thank yeah. you. Thank you for having me. It, <laughs> it, truly, the, it truly is the uh, least we can do, Michael. Yeah, put that, like, <laughs> the, for your next book, if you need a blurb, just put that in there. I like, think I probably, I probably will use that, yes. <laughs> I think this is going to be pretty fun, Michael, because you clearly have no idea what this pod is or what it is even remotely about. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do, and this might be out of left field or not, because you did start this with your camera off, we are going yes. to talk about your outfit. And the choice for you oh, that's is right. do we want to start top down or bottom up? But we would love for you to walk the 18 million listeners at home right now. You could walk them through your fit. Well, to be, well, well to be fair, I knew it was um, aesthetic related. However, okay. I thought I was fancy. Gonna, I thought I wasn't going to be on camera. So... But to be honest, the most you were going to get were like was like me in this Luke Devandros concert T-shirt that I got from the internet. <laughs> that's that's very cool. Um, that I, that is aesthetically pleasing. But I got a fade in it just now, so I need to wash it. So um, I'm sorry I'm disappointed. So basically, I'm in a sleeveless black shirt that I cut up. Um, I am in some running shorts, but I didn't go outside because it's hot. But <laughs> Um, it's all black and I wore some nice Air Maxes with them. Ooh. I, I would have to go get them. You, would that help? Would that if help? you want to. I mean, I, I don't remember names. I'm sorry. Like, it's, no, like it's, a, it's, it's like a pandemic and I don't have sativa anymore. Yeah. I'm like barely holding on. Oh, yeah. I'm coming. One second. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say we only have an, we have, a, I think only an hour with Michael. So let's go get the sneakers for sure. That's what definitely is important right now. This will be good. It's priorities. It's priorities. I know. Absolutely. It's a, it's a reveal. This is like a, it's a reveal. It's an aesthetic-driven podcast. Like, Though maybe oh, if they were cool. completely across his house, I, we maybe should have saved time. I already feel like I'm a strange guest, but to be honest, it's a pandemic. It's fine. Um, yeah. yeah this I is the new normal. Wear, I just There's, wear black and basketball shorts now. What, um, was, so, the haircut, was the haircut your first yeah. cut since quarantine started? Those are, those are infrared Air Max 95s, a fucking classic. Sweet, okay, thank no. you. I wanted to at least impress you somehow, like something. I don't want to be completely right. I had these on a minute ago before I took my shoes off. Um, no, this ain't the first fade I've had. I've been... Um, okay, so my barber um, left the shop because he didn't want to pay the rent and then he got a bus and he started cutting out of a bus. Oh, shit. Um, and they clowned him for it, but then when the pandemic happened, I mean, people were hitting him up. So I've had like him come and wear like a face shield or like a mask to cut me because I am vapid and I was doing press and I just needed to get a fade to feel alive. So this is not my first fade since it ended, but I've gotten a few just because he, he was up the block. And yeah. I was also wanting to support him, you know. City Cuts on real. the go. Yeah. Cuts to go. Yeah. Your press run, your press run has been uh, pretty massive. I saw you on like Breakfast Club. Um, like NPR and shit. Um, but you know, this is the only podcast that matters and you may or may not know <laughs> kind of what we're about, but we're here to tell you the three main subjects of this podcast are money. Okay. Kaching. Yes. Meat, meats and cheeks. Which we'll yeah, get that's, to. that's sex and dating, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Sucking and fucking. And most mm-hmm. importantly, ourselves. Jane yeah. Lart. Okay. You know, that's so, what we're talking about. Yeah, that's, <laughs> we're going to start off with the most important topic, which is the goddamn motherfucking boys. Um, and it's interesting. So, you know, w- you and I, we worked together years ago at Complex on uh, some editor freelance stuff, but we've actually had kind of similar career trajectories. I mean, like throwing fits and yourself. Your debut book, I Can't Date Jesus, it hit the New York Times bestseller list. Similarly, our debut podcast was called Fucking Sick by this dude on iTunes who went by the username Dank Asses Four Twenty. That's real. That definitely. That's a real guy. That really happened. Yeah. And just well, like you, just like you, we launched our sophomore project this year. You just released your second book. I don't want to mm-hmm. die poor. So since since we kind of just copied what we were doing before, we want to know, like, from your perspective, what did you do different? <laughs> what did you do differently this second time around? Yeah. For your we we also don't want to die poor. To be very yeah. clear, 
Honestly, um, I thought a lot of shit was going to change, but it didn't. Um, so when I wrote the book, it was probably one of the worst experiences ever because I was broke. Um, so yeah, so um, I can't date Jesus. Uh, I, th- I think I'm amazing, but I'm black, gay, and don't center white people and like to write the way I like to write. Sure. And I don't present myself in terms of like a pathology, like, oh, it's so awful to be you. So that doesn't make you as marketable at first. So a lot of people did not want to give me... Um, a book that I felt like a, a deserved based comparison on paper, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they underpaid me. So I got high student loans, which is the point of uh, the second book about right. private student loans. So I was fucked. <laughs> so um, I definitely did get a bigger advance for the second book, which is what I deserve. Not rich advance, but it's more than what a lot of people get. However, as I write throughout the book, the fragility of life, as a lot of people are learning right now, you know, if your bills are really fucking high or if you start really behind, you're behind. So if you start behind, you're behind. It only takes but one or two slip ups to fuck you over. I work in media, so you all are not completely foreign to this. Mm-mm. But uh, long, longer story, short version, but one opportunity I thought was going to be really great, moved me out to L.A., all this other shit that was supposed to happen, it blew up in my face. You end up spending money you weren't supposed to. Nightmare. Um, I was very depressed. So it was awful writing the second book, but I liked the second book better than the first one, although really? I like both books. So, yeah. yeah. And I'm Could not- you have written the second book as you did if you hadn't struggled like that in LA trying to be a flexor? Honestly, I mean, I grew up broke. So, I mean, I know sure. I'm rich now and I still got debt. So, I mean, I still keep the mentality. Like, I'm very cognizant of the fact that, like, most people in media don't really recognize that they can. It's, it's a privilege to, to even afford the sacrifices needed to be in entertainment. So I ain't never forgot I was broke. So no, I still could have wrote it. I actually just, if anything, it would have been more peaceful for me to be like, you know, I'm done with this broke shit or at least done enough with this version of it. Um, feel better. But I guess it helped in that, you know, if you're going to suffer through it, it makes it more real. All right. Sure. Which sure. I mean, that's good for the reader, but like not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I mean, one thing that I think kind of defines your writing and just like who you are as a, as a person and, and an awesome personality is like, you're very unapologetic. And I mean, you said it yourself, like you're not going to debase yourself for, you know, the, for white people or anyone really. And you're not afraid to, more. <laughs> you're not afraid to, you and me both. You're not afraid to mix it up on Twitter, which I don't know if you guys follow young cynic, but he's a must follow on all socials. I, I try um, to behave now. Really? That's me That's, trying to behave. This has oh, been me okay. always trying to behave. Um, <laughs> do you get, but like, do you get, especially as like, as a black gay man, do you get a lot of hate thrown your way? Yeah. I mean, it depends on what, okay. So um, it's interesting. So um, all gay people can sound blah, blah, blah. But I think sometimes when I initially first started writing, I was writing about politics and like entertainment. So I didn't, it wasn't an immediate giveaway. I guess that I was gay because um of the tone. Um, It was interesting. I think my tone is very aggressive and people identify that sometimes outside of whatever. I hope that makes sense. But anyway, um, I wrote about Republicans. So they eat racists will email you all the time. In fact, racists read black media more than (laughs) even progressive whites. A lot of people do. So um, before I read it, Yeah, like AOL News, when that was actually a thing, um, I got, I was like 25 writing for politics, so I would get cussed out all the time from racists. Um, Good for your traffic, though. Over the years, I've taken shots at like R. Kelly, Bill Cosby, multiple people before it was a thing, so people cussed me out because of that. Um, The gay thing, yeah, people always quick to throw out that, depending. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. I mean, I curse people (laughs) out back. Yeah, um, I don't come from nice like if you read i can't say jesus uh, you know it was a, a, a violent situation in terms of like the house my dad you know kind of go with the, <laughs> the, uh i'm not a, yeah um i will fight you i don't know how to say it um right, yeah. you can't physically fight now that's not the way unless you have to but in terms of like shit on the computer i'm like that don't bother me like if i been robbed at, yeah like if i've been robbed at gunpoint and my biggest reaction was like, fuck, I got to ride home for free. That's how I always think about student loans. Right. I'm not going to look at some word, some words on the thing and be like, oh my God, my shit bothers me. And I ignore a lot of stuff, but I guess you've noticed. I will cuss you out because people think they can just say whatever the fuck they want to you and no. Um, you see, Are you people too about sensitive on the other side of that, like on the internet now? Like the... I know. don't... I don't think people are too sensitive. I think a lot of people can be assholes. I think a lot of people can take, you know, get bumped behind a computer because they don't have to say it to you directly. Sure. Cause that's my thing. Most people will not say fucked up shit to you directly. I've unfortunately had the most fucked up shit said to me directly from people who, you know, 
around me, my family, other people. Sure. So it's different when you see it in person. But I think a lot of people, I don't like, I don't, I don't say, let me not use the right words. Hold on. Um, no, fucking people don't really say what they mean. <laughs> they yeah. can say it on the computer. I do think some people can be sensitive, but no, I think honestly, a lot of people are awful and mean and will take advantage of that on the computer and they just assume that you won't say anything back, be it because you're a writer or entertainer or a politician or whatever. But, you know, I don't come from as nice a background as some of the people talking that shit. So if you really sure. want to say something, we can go at it. But I don't really think it's necessarily now. It's like a pandemic. So I try not to cut <laughs> people out. It's, it's kind of like yeah. wasteful, ener- useful, yeah. useless energy. Yeah. Does, it ever, does it ever like get to you though? Like does, does anything ever kind of stick? Because you really put yourself out there in your writing and you're kind of like giving a lot of am- ammunition to people yeah. that want to use it. I mean, me and Lawrence, like <laughs> we put ourselves out there, but not the way you do. I, and we put ourselves out there a lot to be clear and people use it against us yeah. every day. So I can't even imagine Michael, Jesus Christ. I was more worried about maybe the second book and writing about being broke. Cause that's more of a sensitive subject for a lot of people. And that's kind of like the worst thing you could ever be in this country. In spite of the fact that a lot of people, right. most people are kind of technically broke and technically broke. Um, I worried about that, but at the same time it's to me, it's like, if I'm putting it in a book, then I already need to be at peace, whatever I'm sure. putting in there. So whoever comes at me, I, I Cause if I allow myself to be potentially bothered by what someone would react to in a book, I'm setting myself up for needless stress. So if it's something I don't really want to put in there that I'm not comfortable with right. talking about yet, don't put the shit in there yeah, unless absolutely. it kind of distracts from the narrative. So I'm worried about it, but I don't really care. That's what I mean, Lawrence. We just slice and dice every single episode. Anytime we, we expose ourselves a little too much, we just have chef here. A Tory yeah. <laughs> but but, uh, the it's smarter that way. Yeah. <laughs> He's our editor. You have a good editor. We have a good editor. Yeah. Um, but Michael, speaking of trolls, you are a renowned expert on Beyonce. So I want to know, I want to get your opinion on this. Uh, she's Uh-oh. been in the news recently. Is there any validity to the conspiracy theory that she's a globalist Italian-American Satanist, according to that politician down in Florida? And Marie Lestrasi. Mamma mia. Now let's get information. Is that as a spicy a, meatball? As another country black Creole person, <laughs> Louisiana roots from Houston, I need white people to let us have us, let us have Beyonce. You take everything else. (laughs) We're not giving Beyonce away. That, I saw that, that only just, (laughs) we're really going to be stuck with like dumbass people in politics for like the foreseeable fucking future. It's not just fucking Kanye West or Donald Trump. It's dumb people like that. Um, So yeah, I I laughed at, I mean, I, I laughed at that, but I also got a headache because that person probably might actually get elected to Congress, if not now, probably in two years. <laughs> Do you think this is, like, the Tea Party shit was bad. Do you see this as, like, the evolution of that? Or is this, like, how do you, because that, that, to me, there was a lot of, like, dummies that yeah. came out of that. But, I, a, but that a, almost me thinking back, it feels like it paled in comparison. Mm-hmm. But there's an article in the Times say about the QAnon candidates. Those people. That had kind yes. of come out the yeah, woodwork. Too. And, like, They're sure. coming Honestly, as much as people blame Donald Trump for everything, Ronald Reagan was a (laughs) stupid motherfucker. Ronald Reagan had cognitive decline. Ronald Reagan started his campaign racism with racism. Ronald Reagan started Make America Again. Ronald Reagan was a stupid entertainer who Republicans realized, oh, if you can make racism, white supremacy somewhat more entertaining, then like it'll come. It's just I believe it's called uh, I believe it's called states' rights. Yes, I and mean, Philadelphia, Mississippi, of all places. So between him, Pat Buchanan, George W. Bush, because George H. Walker Bush was born, there's been a lot of. This is like a continuation of our right. that dumb, but that dumb dead ghost started. So fuck him. I love talking about Ronald Reagan because he's a piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> It's actually the reason Walk why we don't have mental health. But yeah, like I think I think it's literally started, frankly, the year. I was born in 84. He was re-elected in 80. So I think it honestly started under Ronald Reagan and we just got progressively dumber, more awful, more selfish, which is actually most of the shit I write about in the book. It's all Ronald Reagan's fault. Um, <laughs> Donald, Donald Trump is just, he was a B-list actor. Uh, uh, Trump is a reality star. Tucker Carlson could probably be president. He's a cable host. That's the next yeah. kind of thing. All these you know, did you know he's 51? Did you know that Tucker Carlson is 51 years old? He looks good, dude. He's like the white Pharrell, weirdly. I thought he was way younger. I think he actually is. It's not the Democrats. He's the one that's trafficking in like children's blood because how else would he stay so young? Yeah, for real, dude. So much to look into that. He yeah. looks good. Honestly, that fool was born rich. And if you know the right people, I don't know if he got surgery. You can just get a shot and fix that shit. Oh, Fuck for sure. him. Yeah, like, yeah, no, I mean, I knew he was that old because I actually used to read Tucker Carlson in college when I knew he, I didn't agree with him, but he didn't sound as racist. Sure. Uh, 
yeah. Uh, is there anything? Sorry. Is there anything? I mean, I know that Beyonce is like to you and to and to a lot of people. Just, I mean, billions of people around the world. She's like, you know, the goddess. Is there anything that she would have to do for you to lose your love for her? Like, what if she started spewing QAnon shit? Uh, well, she would never do that. But um, Beyonce, I mean, I have been critical of Beyonce before really? when needed. It's just it's probably no evidence of it now because my old blog is gone. <laughs> Rest in peace to cynical ones. There might be some article here and there. But the thing is, I don't think she's perfect. But I mean, she's as close to perfect as we're going to get in this raggedy world. But um, <laughs> no, my thought is no one is above criticism. Um, I genuinely love Beyonce. I have offered criticism when need be but for the most part she usually acts right i'm more worried about um her husband uh <laughs> Ooh. yeah but um do you yeah. get big neoliberal vibes from jay-z we talked about this a little bit on the podcast in passing but what, what can we talk about jay what do you how did you think he handled the kind of nfl partnership and how do you think he is as a, a kind of leader i really want beyonce to still read i can't date jesus and i know that you know at least ken folk I've heard of it directly, um, but I actually wrote about Jay Z last year for Esquire, calling him on that shit because, um, yeah, he's kind of the yeah, I mean neoliberal, yeah, because he thinks you know being a black billionaire actually means something, and I think a lot of rich people, particularly even he didn't grow up that way, but like a lot of upper class upper class black people that exist, middle class black people, Americans, but in general, think like if you make a whole bunch of money, then that solves everybody's problems. But um, I think hopefully people are learning essentially through Kanye and Jay is that you just becoming like the awful rich white men that have ruined the world isn't really going to help anybody else. And also in in terms of like the NFL, it's just like you knew what that was. (laughs) Also, you can't rap that shit on Ape Shit, which is actually one of my favorite songs because I want a Beyonce rap album. That's actually Beyonce's biggest flaw. I don't have a rap album yet. You can't talk about like, yeah. why would you? Yeah, she can rap and she's been rapping since no, no, no. But I'm like, how are you going to talk about all this shit about the NFL and then you work with them and then you pretend you can actually work with the people that's still not giving him a job and then you say it no longer matters? Fuck off. Yes, it does matter. So it's like, I like Jay Z. I always appreciate the music. Thank you for giving Beyonce these lovely kids. And, you know, <laughs> but you cheated on her and you played Kyle Kaepernick and you need to atone. So that's probably the trouble with Beyonce. Harsh, harsh but, but fair. Harsh but fair. Yeah. It's good that you don't, you know, no one's above criticism, like you said. And, and speaking of which, we're going to get to Kanye West in a second. Um, but I just, what are your thoughts on kind of Beyonce's, like, how she's kind of pivoted or not pivoted, but started including more like the personal and the political, especially on her social media and really being like outspoken in, in a way that she never really was before? I usually tell people with this, see, I'm always, and it's not up to you, but it depends on how long you've been paying attention. I'd be paying attention to Beyonce. So like, when I mean, she came out in 98, really before that, I've been there. I also know, like, she's been, even when Destiny Child was starting to pop and go mainstream, Beyonce was very personal. She was very um, outgoing. The problem was, y'all didn't like her. And y'all say, y'all Sorry, I, I don't mean, I don't no, mean. No, no, no. I, no, 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 to answer your question, I just mean, yeah. I think Beyonce took the cues of the Latoya and Latavia breakup and the backlash she got and how they were being booed and remembered. I, I'm not getting, I'm inserting words, but this is my thought. Beyonce is very aware of how superstardom works at a level that most people will never get. And she's particularly aware of how it impacts black celebrities. Cause there haven't been any really black celebrities comparable to her to me besides Michael and Janet Jackson. And look what happened to both of them. Yeah. So I think a lot of what Beyonce has been doing has just been like, particularly when R and B was going down and black radio was going away and Usher was picking up the glow sticks and all these people trying to <laughs> use EDM to stay afloat. And she purposely moved away from that. And she took the initial losses to kind of bring up, this this is all in tandem of like building a lasting audience, also showing politics in terms of like, I'm not going to dilute who I am to appease white people or cater a mainstream market. I'm going to do that. And I think that does work in tandem with her politics. It's just that, you know, she's already proven she doesn't have to rely on radio in that way to have commercial success, although I know that she's back on it. That to me made it easier for her to be political, but I think that was just something that was going to happen naturally and organically and it should because to me she's always been what considers pro-black because i think a lot of respectfully new york la based folks you think you have to see like an ideology and like statements to show to something what is pro- pro-black or what it being political but what i mentioned i can't date jesus and hopefully it's, you know the view has been private but like i'm going to be who i am no matter what that is i'm just going to be the best at it 
And if people come to it, cool. Because people, for folks like me, you know, the, again, I can't date Jesus is the, the idea that black people don't care because they're homophobic and white people are too racist. And those things are necessarily rooted and true. But like 75 year old white women love me. A bunch of gay black boys love me. Mm-hmm. Random straight white men that find the books. Like, you know, I didn't think I would like, I can't date Jesus. But basically, you know, reading about you being scared to suck dick helped me see something in myself. I'm paraphrasing, but like, People can read a good story as a good story. I just think that is an extension of Beyonce's politics and then being more outwardly like, fuck it, sure. Firstly, I don't really need political Beyonce. I mean, wait, let me put that back. (laughs) I I like political Beyonce, but personally in terms of bops, I like Black Effect, but I just really want to talk about being that bitch. So I kind of like the Savage Remix. Um, (laughs) I hope I actually answered your question, but like, I really want to just... And that had bars. Yeah, Yeah. huge bars. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to maybe uh, someone that you don't hold in as high esteem as Beyonce, which is Kanye West. Um, I do not. No. <laughs> you're not a fan of him as a thought leader. <laughs> Honestly, I used to be a big fan of Kanye West. I remember still being at Howard Homecoming 05, him in the backpack, being really cool with him. When I was an intern at MTV News, I actually befriended, I didn't know at the time that I was his girlfriend, but I did. So I have to Alexis communicate. Pfeiffer? Or, Not Alexis. I met Alexis um, in LA when I lived there, but it was another one. Uh, I wonder what she's up to. She was pretty when I saw her, but that was years ago. I mean, pretty okay. still p- popping. Um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so, and, and that was around the time that he was like, homo- hip hop shouldn't be so homophobic. So he meant a lot to me between that hey, and the polo. But I mean, for years and years and years now, I've been writing Complex and all these other outlets. If you listen to what he says in interviews, if you watch him in interviews, he says a bunch of shit that lets you know he really don't give a fuck about black people like that. His only interest is essentially being like a rich white guy. He has befriended right. racists. He has defended fat, racist fashion designers. Was the ACP guy where he basically said they could say John, oh yeah, APC, John yeah, his boy. John did. He defends that stupid. He got dragged. He got dragged on the episode yeah. that came out today. Damn, so two this, weeks in a row that we're dragging a, a APC. Theme. Let's fucking go. <laughs> then it was the the racist photographer that tried to adopt a black kid for a picture, some dumb shit like that. I forgot her name, but she's awful. So him being cool with Donald Trump is not surprising because he's. I mean, I, I understand that there might be some other issues there, but by and large, he's not smart. <laughs> he said one nice thing about black people a long time ago. And while he's recently might have given some money, he's basically a, a dummy who's now rich, who can't do shit. And now I got to deal with more dumb rappers. I'm <laughs> trying to be nicer. I'm sorry. Let me not say that. Um, <laughs> no, fuck it. That was dumb with Chance Day yesterday. Uneducated <laughs> yeah, was, people. Yeah, yeah, that was bad. That was, I feel like that was a pretty embarrassing look for Chance because like, you don't have to, yeah. like already people think you're corny and the wife guy and that. You, you know, you don't have any slaps anymore. You don't need to then go and, like, endorse Kanye West just because you guys are homies. Like, that's... Sweet. Why was he asking that dumbass question he already knew the answer to? Like, yeah, my exactly. God, you were born with... Like, I don't come from money. Like, you're like... He's like a... I'm a damn near gated community. I had burglar bars in my house. And you were you went to the best, like, better schools and all this other stuff. Your dad worked for Obama. So yeah. you, you actually could ask somebody, yo, what's between him and Joe Biden? I don't even fuck with Joe Biden like that. But obviously, what's the difference between him and Kanye West? Kanye don't read. This motherfucker don't read. I still am... Um, yeah. And that's, again, that's, I think with Kanye... I like wanna, Biden Trump. Yeah. I want to fucking root for Kanye. Well, I did. But yeah. I don't have it in my heart. Fuck my heart. I don't have it in me at all <laughs> as a black person to fuck with somebody that don't fuck with black, all black people that will bend over backwards to appease dumb racist white people was all to feel down. Fuck him. Huh. Was there a, was there like a tipping point? Like, was there one moment? Like whether I'm it was sure like, it was cute. <laughs> but was there a tipping point where you kind of were like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Like for literally people, like, like 2014, 2014, 2013, honestly. Early. That I was tra- early. Yeah. Very yeah, because, that's pre-Pablo. He still had slaps in him. That was Jesus. Jesus was 13. Yeah. Pa- Pablo, no, pa- Jesus I didn't really like anyway. Pablo really? I like, oh, but, um, love Jesus on this podcast. <laughs> I get it. It's a very, I, I get the, I get the. It's I lean get, and it's mean and it's angry. And as samples, a white guy, it really speaks yeah. to me. He samples Marilyn Manson. Yeah, I mean, I like the beautiful people, but I don't want to hear that shit. I mean, I don't know if that was um, the, pop, the Pablo tours when he started going on those rants and when he yeah, started it was twenty, that and that's twenty sixteen. Yeah, I can forgive people who have done some pretty awful shit to me directly and have what I will never forgive, particularly if it's not fixed, is a black person who literally 
publicly. He's by the even by then he was already rich and well known. Yeah. In terms of even fashion, oh, he didn't even need that backing. He didn't need to go out of his way to excuse racist to speak ill of black people. I can pull a specific example, but again, I've written about him a lot, so it's off the top or whatever. But he just says so many things. But like, can you? Yeah, I can let you go from back then because that already let me know what type of dudes you are. You don't fuck with black people like that. Generally speaking, Michael, can you separate the art from the artist? I know that that's no. something that I, no. Yeah. In some cases, maybe, but with him, no. He slavery is a choice. Fuck you, Donald Trump. Fuck you. That shit he did even a few years ago. And he's not talking about voting. Fuck him. Like no. And honestly, the voting the thing, thing is crazy. He seems so proud of that. This yeah. is. I know it, it came up again in the most recent whatever Forbes, whatever that is. I don't even. I don't know why they keep entertaining him. Obviously, I guess for clicks and shit. But the voting thing seems like he. The fact that he doesn't get that that's that's the that's the way that he could be a good influence, you know, like I don't well, he, like just he, he don't by really, saying um, that you're registered to vote. I don't know. It's funny. Well, I think the whole thing is that he's trying to be like I buck the system. I'm not like I'm not the, voting. I'm not following the path that you people tell me that like all yeah. you people tell me to do. And Disruptor. I think, also, I think it's also just an obsession with wealth and status yeah. and celebrity. He is the child of a professor. God rest her soul, and he don't know shit. Um, what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, well, I guess my next no, question cool. was, was the question was, what are your thoughts on Kanye West? Which I think you answered. I um, nailed yeah. it. Check that out. Like, not that, not that these people exist because, you know, once Terry Crews endorses you like he did with Chance, Chance just walked it all the way back. Yeah. But like, for people that are even entertaining the fact of voting for Kanye over Joe Biden, and like you, we don't necessarily fuck with Biden either, but like, what do you say to these people that are, you know, like, hmm, Kanye, maybe in the White House? Like, yeah, maybe I fuck with Kanye over Biden. Like, what do you, what do you say to them? If I'm being polite, I won't call them stupid. Um, (laughs) But, um, okay, so I will say, I actually don't think Kanye West will make as much of an impact on the election as he might currently think he might, but he could make a, he, cause I mean, honestly, like it's a pendant. We're all like, people are dying. So I'm just like, I don't really see how this is going to go. And it's, and none of this is going to get better until we get rid of that man. So I just don't see him making that much of an impact. But to the people who do feel that way, the thing is, I actually understand why people don't vote. I understand why people are not interested. I understand like nihilism isn't bred of nothing. Like I get that people feel rejected, particularly in a state like Texas, where there are millions upon millions of people who could be voting and just don't. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. My dad has voted twice. He voted for Obama. I understand exactly why he wouldn't vote, because who's ever actually really bothered? But that said, with Kanye, I'm just like, if you have the, I mean, if he can get you interested in politics, then, you know, that depresses me, but welcome. (laughs) But at the same time, it's just kind of like, particularly in what state you're in, you have an opportunity to stop the racist game show host with cognitive decline from potentially killing us all and further turning this country into the Taj Mahal, the version that they're about to implode apparently into rubble. Why in the fuck would you vote for the guy who needs to be focused on this gap thing he just told us about two weeks before he decided he wanted to fake be president? Like, <laughs> Do we need another person? Never mind. They don't care, actually, now I think about it. If you're going to vote for Kanye West, you can fuck what I'm saying. But I'll lift you in prayer, even on Mahaven, um, and pray that you do something else. I'm sorry. No, fuck Kanye. Don't vote for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I mean, Michael, so the book, <laughs> the book I Don't Want to Die Poor came out in April. It's yes. now mid-July. So I don't know if you're like, you know, thinking about a third project or whatever, but if you were to write a book, that wasn't, I mean, I don't know about you, but like me and Lawrence, we, this podcast used to focus on ourselves and kind of our own personal stories. We very quickly ran out of interesting things to talk about ourselves. Yeah. So I don't know if you're like looking for outside material besides like your own lived experience, but yeah. if you had to, if you could write a book on someone and we're given like, you know, all the access and all the resources, Carte who would it be? Yeah. I actually don't want to write a book on it. I want to get into TV and make real money with better insurance, but okay. I'm going to pivot the question and answer. Um... What's the what 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 show ideas we got? Well, the first, the cow. Well, the, well, the first book is actually an option. Um, Ooh, that was on what? deadline, so I, it's not like a secret. But um, sure. TV moves very slow, and you know, and actually, you can take this. Well, I don't take this part. I'm very interested in the second book, so hopefully that'll happen. But um, who would I want to do? Mm. Is it Beyonce? No, that's is it. No, um, is it Erica Jane? Erica Jane. Okay, so <laughs> actually, 
Shit, I'm sorry. I'm I'm gonna get this. Hold on. Uh, who the fuck do I care about right now? <laughs> actually, yeah. Can I write? I want to do something with Beyonce, but like a documentary where she actually lets me ask her questions and where she's not editing it. Right. Because I would really, and then that's not a diss to her. Again, I I, I understand the mechanics of particularly being a black entertainer because you can be so big and then be nothing. Because Janet Jackson lost a whole decade, so I get it. But no, I want <laughs> Beyonce to let me do a documentary with her where I actually could interview her and ask her real questions like about the breakup people in the industry some of these men yeah i would be more stuff like that you know right but she couldn't get final cut because then you'd have a documentary no like three minutes long that's actually true well so if i can't do that then i would love to do a documentary on um why are so many men awful uh, particularly in <laughs> men are <hip-hop>. trash in <laughs> the movie. yes like i have the equivalent of like gender equivalent of white guilt and <laughs> men this year have really been disappointing me more than usual um sorry not present company but um you know present company excluded yeah yeah I think men are trash is a, is a common through line yeah. in a lot of our episodes and we agree. Like exhibits a and b um, I believe all of the good men in the entire world are actually on this Zoom call right now. Like, I'm sure y'all not going to go up and de- 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 defend the sanctity of Fat Farm, but I recently <laughs> read about, like, Russell Simmons being given a place to, like, oh, still you, do uh, interviews. Yeah. And that, did you watch that doc? I did. I ended, up, I ended up, I was supposed to write about that. I ended up talking more about just, like, at the same, like, around the same time. It was, like, so many different examples of men, so many different ages literally just being really awful <laughs> about women and some of the uh, you know the survivors accusers um read the piece and like reached out and i felt so bad that some in particular like one in particular said like about crying because they just didn't feel like men particularly black men were um defending them right so um keeping this, a lot of these men who are awful happen to work in fashion so keeping this all together i would love to just expose the the men who have started labels some off the platform wasn't lit with all due respect. But yeah, he's an <laughs> awful person. And why is he still here? <laughs> right. Is, is he not like uh, hiding out in Bali? Yeah. I yes. he absconded. Where they, where, where they curiously can't, they don't have extradition. Yeah, but he's yeah. still doing press. He's doing Zoom from Bali. Um, That's to, fucking... Yeah. I mean, so you, so you mentioned, before you were so rudely cut off by this trash man next to me, Lawrence, uh, you said <laughs> men, particularly in hip hop. Why yes. do you think it's... it's I mean, do you want to dig into that a little bit? Like, I, I mean, the misogyny in, in the lyrics, yeah. I think, has been like endemic um throughout like the whole genre's history but like well hip-hop is still by and large the most popular pop culture like thing in the uh the, the, the country so i mean whatever globally so just commercially like we're all contributing but in terms of like some of these people who i think should know better particularly if they're like over 30 or fucking i don't know 20 it's just <laughs> yeah it's just many examples like people in the press who shouldn't be giving him space to talk or at least pushing back hard on him it shouldn't be just women pushing on him spike lee shouldn't be defending woody allen and then taking it back on twitter yeah. um I, i'm gonna keep going like you know there's been certain r&b singers accused repeatedly um of assaults and nothing has been said yet everybody's patting themselves on the back for finally getting rid of r kelly now that you know m- most folks don't really have a choice so you know i think there's a lot of reason to call folks out again i'm trying to be more zen this year so not always my place but you, these are the things i like damn we're really still being awful <laughs> it, I, it, is, it is curious that like the music industry has yes there's been some like you know high profile like cancellations um but like the me too movement never really kind of like uh, yep. ran through the ranks of the, the, the industry, not just the front, you know, the, the consumer facing artists, but like the executives yep. and besides guys like Russell Simmons and, and, you know, a few other like big execs. LA Reid has been accused and I, I wrote something else before the Russell thing and not noted it. Um, I will say where, but um, she was like a senior VP somewhere at a major label and definitely hit me afterwards to j- literally just vent about, you know, these men in space. So it's like men in music in particular that are allowed to do things. So I would love to do something like a on the record, but just kind of not because it needs to be from a male perspective, but I think other men are not holding men accountable. So I could trash Fat Farm. I could talk about some of Kanye's earlier works while also pointing out how like all of these men are garbage. I'm really rambling, but somebody's probably going to take this um, because there's no content right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I mean, all right. So let's talk about, let's bring it back from the micro down to the micro, from the macro down to the micro again. Um, you know, a lot of, I don't want to die poor is dealing with like financial struggles and, mm. and student loan. Was there a single moment? And like, I can point to my single most broke boy moment. And I don't know if Lawrence can as well, but like, 
Yeah. What was your most broke boy moment in New York City where like you just knew you're just like, all right, like this is kind of not rock bottom, but financial. Yeah, basically. Maybe it is. Yeah. Um, in the first chapter, I um, essay, I talk about how um, I was finally up for like a pay speaking gig. I had like a first time I was featured in the New York Times Center Review. My book was coming out and I was going to go talk to Andrew Sullivan of all people, which was not a pleasant experience. But because of a def- but because of one, a fear of defaulting on one of my private loans, which would fuck up my mom's shit, too. And then being double charged for something and them just being like, oh, oops, you owe this anyway. I didn't have any money to get to the, I barely had the money to get to the pay speaking gig. They were supposed to reimburse me and barely trying to eat. And then when I went to go talk to Andrew Sullivan, which was as miserable as it sounded, (laughs) I somehow became the symbol of the, of real racism along with Ta-Nehisi Coates, allegedly. And then he also pointed out how elitist I was and that I hated Catholics because I said I was a recovering Catholic. So, um, that there's must have also, been rich. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, there's like they made gifts of me rolling my eyes at him, and then <laughs> repeatedly just being like, "I don't want to do." It. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah, and right. then afterwards he was like, w- "Was I really that bad?" I'm like, "Man, fuck you, get out of my face." So that was <laughs> that, that felt really bad. Where I'm like, I don't. I'm like in the negative in my account. I'm using a little bit of credit on my credit card left to like get a bus ticket and make sure I eat to get paid, you know, pretty nicely and get, you know, to do all this stuff. And then I'm not only having to talk to this idiot who was born into so much privilege and still manages to be an overeducated fool, <laughs> but if this isn't me supposedly turning a corner in my career and supposed to be successful, but here I am. So that made me feel really like low. Um, and I can only afford to edge up. So not even a whole face. So I didn't even look as great <laughs> as I wanted. Just makes it really sad all around. <laughs> you could have, uh, you could have gotten a cut. If you knew, if your barber was in the bus, you could have gotten a cut on the way to, you could kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. He wasn't in the bus. Then he went, I had a cash for it. He, he got me a lineup, but that was it. Very sad. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I know that you spent time in where well, you went to school in, or partly part of your college education was in like the DC area, a uh, city that's been called, it has the charm of a northern city and the efficiency of a southern city. You've lived in L.A., is that right? Is it efficient of a southern city? They say that about D.C.? Yeah. Um, that's generous. Um, <laughs> who are you saying? I'm sorry. <laughs> you, spent, you spent time in L.A. where there's just zanny in the air, right? Yeah. And you're, you're now in Harlem um, in the greatest city in the world, the only city that matters. What do you miss most about – but you're from Houston, so I guess my question is what, what do you miss most about living in, in the south or Texas? I miss – the food in Houston. I miss the people in Houston. Um, this, fried, fried, great Gatorade. Is that right? Um, fried alligator. I, I don't fuck with the gate. I, I saw that. No, um, the thing about Houston is like Houston, even if it's a country as city and it's kind of like been become even bigger than when it was already big as a kid, it's probably one of the most diverse. I mean, it's already technically now as we, as ethnically diverse as New York. And so in hindsight, I realized, and even then it was always like one in four foreign born. So even if you don't grow with money, even if you don't have a lot of access, even if you were prone to like the way cities are segregated, you're still exposed to a lot more different types of people than you even realize. So that part I actually missed, just things are slow in the South and it's also like quieter and people actually respect space. Um, Yeah, no, it really blows my mind in New York. Like God bless y'all folks, but how when people walk in the center of the street it blows my mind because i'm like you live in a tiny overpopulated city you know motherfuckers are always moving none of you people think let me just lean on one side so i might not be in somebody else's way that one little thing is like oh god i get the fuck out of here before flu season we all gonna die um (laughs) dc i actually liked even though i got robbed at gunpoint in dc but i could get robbed anywhere at gunpoint that's the beauty that's really the beauty of america you know where I got robbed at a point in D.C., it's like a Trader Joe's over there now, which is cute. Um, they changed the Northeast. I actually really like D.C. Not many black people there anymore. There's not as many, so that's weird. I liked L.A. I'm actually moving back to L.A. Uh, Our condolences. <clears throat> no, don't worry about me. I'm good. I'm a hike. I'm a hike and shit. Um, smoke weed. <laughs> Be real smoke weed. You can smoke oh, yeah. weed in New York. But I can have, well, I can, you can have weed delivered in New York, but like you have more variety when you order the weed. You go to the store. Uh, okay. You go to the you know, like, you go to the store. You, like, you want to go and pick it out and do the whole thing. Yeah. Not it. even that. I just, I could buy it on an app and have them come drop it off at <laughs> sure. the house. I just think, you know, once, every different strokes, um, 
Are you moving out there to uh, because your TV? Yeah, your Hollywood dreams. Aspirations. Um. Yes. I mean, part of it. I mean, that's part of it. But honestly, I'm have already decided. I mean, TV. I would love to make TV money, but realistically, a racist game show host is control of our destinies. Um, California just got shut down again, so. You know, as much as I think I would be great in television, that's still case by case, sure. pandemic by pandemic. So <laughs> I need to sell some more books in between and then just go live in California in a nicer apartment with my weed delivered um, <laughs> and hiking. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm planning for TV, but I'm realistic to the fact that like nothing is for certain. I just think at my age, right, it's the happy medium between what I miss in the South and what I got to do to make money. Although my mom now thinks I should move to Atlanta and she used to be with that gay shit. So I'm like, that's a different turn. So we'll see. I ain't moving to Atlanta. Um, <laughs> Black, Black Hollywood? Black no? Hollywood, yeah. That's the... I can go shoot there if need be, like everybody. <laughs> and then if I want to... Get your tax credits. Yes. Sure. I mean, I would live in Atlanta if I didn't want to... If, if the ground moved too much in LA, the race war took over, some shit like that. <laughs> and then maybe I could be like... Portia's friend on Real Housewives. I, would, I could do that. <laughs> a good, well, that's a good about, plan B, a good fallback. <laughs> yeah. Portia's a freedom fighter now, too, so our politics are long. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask about, uh, you, you kind of mentioned, like, uh, the TV industry being, like, super racist and, and homophobic still. Um, so, like, something that just happened in, like, the world that me and Lawrence occupy is Hood by Air just announced that it's coming back. And, you know, I, we... yeah. We were we were at Complex when uh, not at its birth in '06, but when it really kind of like stepped into the limelight in like t- 2012, 2013. Um, and people are only kind of now giving Shane and the whole collective their due about like how influential they were, uh, you know, back then, how ahead of their time. I guess my question is, you know, especially in, like the the streetwear world that we occupy, which is full of just you know straight men. Do you think that black queer culture gets the recognition it deserves? for being really the source of what eventually becomes mainstream culture, or are we still... And cool mainstream culture. Like yeah, the or good, are we still... The best we still, mainstream culture. <laughs> and this kind of goes to like, you know, I don't know if there's, if you consider that there's like better or more representation in mainstream culture now, like on TV or on, on the big screen, but I don't know. Or do we still kind of just like shove it aside and not even give black queer culture its due? Um, I think sometimes what people... I, there's a broader black queer culture that I understand that people are referring to, but then there's also just kind of like black or any cult, like so many other, and by that I mean like Hood by Air, I actually found out through other black gay folks um, because most of, like a lot of my friends obviously work in New York. They either work actually in fashion. Um, they're like the stylists or like buyers or like people work on the ads. So like, that's how I knew a lot about it anyway. Plus also those are folks who were like probably wearing it first and just in my immediate um circle um i think in some ways yes um more black queer designers about attention a lot of us are getting more attention but at the same time uh okay here. black designers are still struggling just for the fact that like as of right now when anything is an economic crisis it disproportionately impacts black people altogether so even before this even as a lay person my friends are more so like the fashion kids i just make sure i don't look bad around them um <laughs> Whatever. But, you know, I think like there are certain black designers I even know of or have met or have followed just, you know, being a fan of like some of this stuff that I know like will do like a great year and then just don't have any money. And now that like when there are like bigger houses that stores are like closing down they're or they're not paying for these orders or returning the orders and they're being stiff, I kind of worry about all of what little progress has been made or not even little, but the progress that has been made is going to like fall back. So right. that concerns me, but I am, I, I did see the hood by air. I saw the tweet. I need to go back and look. I got to avoid Twitter right now. Uh, yeah. There's like four pillars to the brand now. Yeah. That's going to be this full kind of like, not to use this kind of t- 360 degree thing that is, that seems really exciting. And hopefully right. it'll be kind of like a true rebirth. Cause to James's point ahead of its time, without a doubt. Yeah. And uh, you don't see the amazing stuff stuff coming out of brands i think like telfar now or you know um we got seeing guys like ian isaiah go fucking nuclear mm-hmm. if you don't have could buy air and chain what those guys and his crew did so uh, you know fingers crossed but it's hard to say like i just remember that being such a big thing and then seeing how quickly it went away so it was yep. nice to see it come back but it's after rocky of- did not fucking help by the way 
that you know <laughs> that don't surprise me though <laughs> like yeah. I, like ace has music but that don't that don't surprise me of course he didn't i mean not of course he didn't but like uh um but to the broader uh, question about like just quick question in general you know I, I like in publishing there are more in tv there are a few more right um to my liking no i say i would say probably publishing right now is kind of an of that you have so many different types of black queer writers writing different types of stuff and we don't all sound the same there is a little bit more in like TV, but not a lot. Um, it's even less in film. Actually, <laughs> while I was trying to um, smoke my way through the dystopia <laughs> and going through all of the queer- That's a good episode title, Smoking Our Way Through the Dystopia. <laughs> all of the queer related content on all the streamers, it was so bad and most of the stuff didn't even really apply. And if you were black in particular, I'm like, how does this Kiki Palmer movie Pimp fit? But I guess technically she like, I mean, it's just like, it was funny, but it was also like, we don't have a wide range of stuff. Like that's, I have a pimp shit of it, but like there's that in Pariah. So do you see any black queer women? When you think of black queer m- m- movies led with men, Moonlight is all you can think of. If I ask you a TV show, then, you know, and honestly, even in some of the conversations I've had about, you know, I, uh, I Can't Do Jesus adaptation, I've heard deja vu. I mean, I've heard excitement, but I've also heard the deja vu comments um, about trying to sell I Can't Date Jesus where somebody said, oh, this has been done before. And they're like, really, where? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, where, where does that exist? Because y'all keep telling me it, um, it doesn't exist. This is why you won't take a risk on it. So I'm encouraged, but it's just very disappointing. And I know that we're basically being like the depression again doesn't really help, but yeah. I'm still hopeful because white people have discovered racism really exists and we weren't making it up. So, yeah. <laughs> so we still have hope in, in like your, in your very initial conversations um, around like TV adaptation and uh, have you felt any sort of shift from like white people or, or the people occupying the boardrooms or those in power that are like maybe more inclusive or more open to hearing uh, thoughts from your non, you know, the people that aren't traditionally in like writers' rooms um, or boardrooms. Um, I think when I can day Jesus started, um, I was fortunate enough in that. I think because of Moonlight and other like shows and then poses are in them that helped. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm still not susceptible susceptible to the. I honestly, for the rest of my life, I always know that people are going to undervalue my commercial viability and not just mine, but my voice and whatever I want to do. Uh, I'm encouraged as of late with certain folks that, you know, there seems to be like an actual interest in kind of paying maybe what you owe. But, uh, you know, we'll see by the end of the week. I would have a better answer for you. <laughs> I have, I have a, like I have some I have some uh, like a meeting, but we'll see. Check but, in. Yeah, yeah. Tap in we'll, have little, we'll have a little epilogue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would just say like on, in one situation, you know, it sounded all nice. It, it's what they, it's how it usually starts, and then it kind of fizzled away. And now there are other people who might be more committed in light of recent events. So we'll see. Right. But it's really hard to sometimes hold folks accountable when right. you just know how this keeps going. Um, but again, I'm trying to remember how optimistic. No, so somebody give me a TV show. Several. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 listen, you have Throne Fits the only podcast that matters rooting for you we're in your corner michael as a gay black man who's also clearly very progressive in his politics how do you balance identity politics with like class issues and you know things like what we've been talking about student loan relief universal health care that kind of stuff i think everyone is informed by identity politics particularly in america i think the problem more often than not is that people either can't look outside of their identities and when trying to make like a broader assessment or they don't factor in other people's identities and circumstances um, and how that might, you know, impact their, how they feel about something. In the case of student loans, um, over a trillion dollars of debt. So obviously impacts everybody, no matter who you are. But if you are black, you might fall more victim to private student loan debt, which is not really even, it's a hundred billion of the more than one trillion, but a hundred billion is a lot of money. A hundred billion disproportionately impacts black college graduates. Where do most black people got graduate from college from? And it's not about whether school is better or not for the people who have those mindless arguments about PWI and black sure. schools. But most black people, by honestly virtue of circumstance, 
but there's no sense in that because they were made for us, graduate from black colleges. Black people don't have as much capital for a lot of different reasons. So these lenders take advantage. I take full responsibility for what I, the loans I took out in the loan. But what I explain is that this whole concept of personal responsibility, it doesn't negate the fact that like the system as design literally fucks over everybody. It just fucks you over a little bit worse depending on where you fit on like the totem pole. Right. So it's the, the difference between like, I could have the same debt as somebody else, but they might've gotten most of their debt from government loans. So the government will, I mean, they're paying the ass, but they'll fucking work with you. They'll let you die without sure. shit be like, whatever. If you're private loans, you're essentially doing like the equivalent. I took the educational equivalent of a subprime mortgage loan. They targeted right. me. Pred- it's, pr- it's predatory. Yeah. So I, just as of now, I finally started paying off some loans, some of my private loans uh, last month. I'm not out of debt. I have a ways to go. But on a 12-year plan, which I guess might have been extended to 13 because of the two six-month breaks they give you, I've already paid $90,000 in loans on a $60,000 loan since 2007, the end of 2007. That doesn't include the small government loans I took out that have since tripled because you actually can put those in. Difference. So again, that's my choice. Or the extra loan I took out a private loan because I had a, a medical issues that made me um, end up having a school year. Again, it's all my issue, but the fact is there are other ways to do this that didn't sure. have to be so predatory, but they were by design kept away from me. Like when people keep saying even now, like, oh, would you go back and do all these? Like, I was like, yeah, what the fuck else would I do? Like, yeah, right. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be in the position to do any of these things. Even if I went to a cheaper school and I was still probably, I would still have debt. And regardless, most people, regardless of what you're making in this country, no matter how big you think the check is, it's probably not what you should be getting. Absolutely. Because for 40 years, we've been all stagnant. So in that way, it informs all of us. But the identity politics and sometimes it's some folks, well, Think about that New York Times thing. A lot of people, definitely a lot of people, white folks especially. Well, <laughs> I did this in 19 something something. I did this something years ago. I don't give a fuck what you did because it doesn't matter what the fuck you did. I'm not going to benefit from debt cancellation, but now more than ever do we need to have it because, again, it disproportionately impacts some of us more than it should. By and large, it would benefit all of us because more people would be able to buy shit, buy clothes and shit. I, ain't, I never even got to buy hood out here. You know why? Because I was paying... Over a thousand dollars a month in student loans. So for a while, I couldn't even, you know, do the drip because yeah. the drip went to the, the debt. Your whole um, drip budget was to pay off loans with interest. Yeah, and I had to humble myself. Nobody should have to go through any of that. So it's and it's not even just and not even not being able to drip. I'm talking about struggling to eat, sure, pay bills, absolutely. do stuff. But, but you know, like it's all of those things where I can tandem. So why people are like, I'm so much better because I pay this off. Like fuck off, you're not. You shouldn't. Yeah. Your thought should be, let me be less of a selfish asshole. For some reason, in this pandemic. It's literally dependent on everybody being less of a selfish asshole. So many Americans seem very dedicated can't, to can't being awful. That. Yeah, no. The, the, the lack of the lack of empathy uh, in this Just country is, is going to kill us. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So that. Um, Michael, you know, we're running out of time here, so I want to move on to the second topic. We're done talking about ourselves. Uh, we've kind of already been touching on money a lot, um, but, you know, we are going to get into that. And we do think that kind of like salary and revenue transparency is radical, radically... Uh, a, a much needed conversation to have. So while this used to be a gauche question, now it's actually super progressive. We want to know how much money do you make? Yeah. I don't know this year. Um, and I just found it. Well, <laughs> okay. So I would say last year, I probably, I don't, uh, I might've moved into like, Oh, I don't know. I'm talking about like this, but this is part of my growth. <laughs> I think I've actually probably made over a little 100 last year because of, um, I well, I'm sorry, I haven't calculated. I might have been around there, might have a little been under because I will say I got my, uh, a big part, big part of my earned income last year was getting two of my book advances and I did out earn despite getting paid so little for the first book. So some of that is royalties and work. But there was also that summer where like, it's kind of a blur and I, <laughs> about, so I have to see. Um, I would say now I'm doing a lot better. I am, uh, I mean, I'll just, say a lot this. Mm-hmm. I'll just say this, like you are one of the f- very few people we can probably count on one hand that have actually honestly answered that question. Yeah. Because it's such a taboo a subject. Um, yeah, and we kind of I- ask it, we kind of ask it just to like make the guest uncomfortable, uh, which is always like kind of entertaining, but uh, bravo for. Yeah, thank you. Because to be blunt thank for a long time, service. I was making like the 70, 80. Yeah. range maybe even just 70 70 80 
and but by, and by, by the way, that, that this is freelance. This is like yeah. still having to deal with taxes. This is me doing a, a, an obscene yeah, amount sure. of work because sure. like even last year, I think I actually did make probably into six, but it didn't really matter um, because I'm still paying well over a thousand dollars behind in, in loans. I was You're prolific. Debt. I lost my health insurance when I became a New York Times bestselling author because before mm-hmm. that year, when I was writing the book, I didn't make really anything. So it just kind of depends. I'm better off now, but as I try to remind folks, like the fragility of the economy is a lot oh, more. Oh, we know. Yeah, I know. It's like right now, you know, I'm doing good, but who's to say, you know, somebody will be like, you know, our budget. Yeah. Right, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, we try to get you know? people to pay $5 a month for a second podcast. And it's tough for some people to even afford that. I mean, it's not good. Our, we're not as good as you, but still, you know. We well, no, no, no. Y'all, y'all have a massive following, but it doesn't even matter because people are struggling. Just like me, like yeah. I released a book at the time it was the deadliest week of the pandemic. And I had been repeatedly saying on Instagram, like, I ain't got money to pay your bills because I'm trying to get these people off my back um, <laughs> get, and get me and my mom out the ghetto. Um, that's uh, hy- hyperbolic, not. But, um, Right. I also know asking people, even on paperback, which is much cheaper, asking people to spend twelve, fifteen, seventeen dollars on a right. book is a lot to ask when people are trying to figure out how to pay rent, how to eat, how to do anything off of twelve hundred dollars. So as yeah. grateful as I am when folks say, Oh, I spent my Trump check on you, I was like, Did you have it? I've even bought books for people, which I had planned to do because I already knew if you didn't if you had student loan debt the way I do, which a lot of folks do, it really does depend on what you can do for leisure. So I've tried to be helpful in that way because, I mean, the book is funny, but honest about how it can be being broke. And I also tell people that. And very poignant to this moment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because I felt was interesting. Like in, laser specific to right now. <laughs> I hate how specific it was. Right? Like, my concern is like, you know, a lot of people were dealing with the, the year before because before, we've had this blinders of like, oh, the economy is great. I'm like, is it? Um, yeah, right. For who? <laughs> when most folks say they're two checks away from like complete ruin, as we've been exactly. here for years, we now have proof. Like the brand yeah. lines are long. It's yeah. yeah. But I get it. I'm grateful. Uh, that's why I need, actually need to hurry up and sell another book or two or three just in case we have know. money coming in. You never know. Uh, yeah. Mike, you I want to get I want to people who've checked the check. Uh, Michael lives booked the book. It is what it is. <laughs> You know, I want to get into the third and final topic, which, which is, is a not, check. <laughs> yeah, which is a check. Same thing. Uh, it's lean, same thing. Yeah. Meats and cheeks. Um, are you booed up right now? Are you partnered no, up? No. All right. Oh, so man. between LA, New York City, and DC, which city between those three has the most trash dating scene? Yeah. I don't know if that's fair because I've had my own issues, but oh, no, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> yeah, personal in, problems aside. <laughs> when I was an intern, New York was great. It's not for me now, but there are many attractive people here. I really wanted to be a hoe before I left, but can't do that. Just got to <laughs> masturbate. DC <laughs> has a lot of nice looking people, but um, no They're disrespect all to, to, to the area and area. So I said it wrong, my accent <laughs> off. Um, <laughs> but them Capitol Hill types, ugh. Um, I hate. It. I hate. What are they just them. like? Are they just like in, like closeted, like looking for? Some are closeted, or just some are self important. In, in terms of the class shit, like fundamentally, I just am. I I like. I don't have. I still live in a little bitty apartment in Harlem. So even though I'm making more money, I'm still paying shit off. Sure. But even then, I have the perspective of somebody. I just didn't grow up with money. Uh, when I tell, when people see my house, they're like, oh shit, that, whatever. <laughs> it might not give away because of the game, but I'm a lot more hood than most of that type I can deal with. Um, I love a smart man, but not, and, but you mean smart and hood and just not pretentious and boring. And most of them DC people, whatever. There's a few I still want to fuck though. So we'll see. Keep <laughs> what, are their names? what are their names? If, in case they're listening. Yeah. Do you want to shout them out <laughs> in your plugs section of the podcast? <laughs> well, he don't know me. I just seen it. We have mutual friends. It started with an end. Oh, it's a, oh, yeah, All right. Well, when you, back back on, when you come back on the pod to plug book number three. Yeah. We'll I got you. Um, LA, I'm actually, people, um, it's so, uh, people give me more attention to LA and I don't live there, but that's not a good thing. Cause that could be something else. <laughs> Because we'll I've had I've had family members that never talked to me being like, "Hey, cousin, no, fuck off." <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael, thank you for coming on the old Thanks, po- only podcast that matters. Where can the kids follow you? Yeah, I am at Young, spelled the regular way, S N I C K. So that's cynic. That's my that was my rap name from a blog post that I just never changed it. So it's it's my version of Jeezy. I'm gonna be Young Cynic when I'm like 15. <laughs> sure. Um, 
Thank y'all for having me. I no, thank it. you, Michael. Um, well, I got talked y'all's head off, but no, yeah. no, you're bro, no, I mean, normally you got to really come back on for part two because normally these yeah. last three or four hours. So that's what we. Yeah, have I to would do definitely have a little back. taster, an appetizer. Sorry, Oosh, Michael, hop off the Zoom, chef. Hit that motherfucking outro music, baby. I had a really good time having you back. Tick-tock when I dance. dance On that demon time, she might start her OnlyFans Only Big B and that B stand for bands If you wanna see some real ass, baby, here's your chance I say left cheek, right cheek, drop it low and swing Sex is up in this thing, put you up on this game I be parking my frame, gang, 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 gang If you don't jump to put jeans on, baby, you don't feel my pain Please don't give me hype, write my name in ice Can't argue with these lazy bitches, I just raise my price I'm a boss, I'm a leader, I pull up in my two-seater And my mama was a savage, nigga got this shit from Tina I'm a savage, yeah Classy, bougie, ratchet, yeah Sassy, moody, nasty, yeah Acting stupid, what's happening, what's happening Bitch, I'm a savage, yeah Classy, bougie, ratchet, yeah Sassy, moody, nasty, yeah Acting stupid, what's happening Like me, I say, like me. He want a bitch like the stay with.